Let's get educated. That's why we're here, to bring you the stories impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses. It's time for a little education. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this lovely show known as Educated. It is me, Katie Patrick, joined by Mr. David Fiorazzo. Hi. And uh, before we get before we get to that, before we get started, I do want to show some love to our sponsor, Switch to America. We're moving into the holiday season here. We have all the holidays coming up. So it's important to support small businesses right here in the U.S. of A. And we can all do that by visiting our friends at SwitchToAmerica.com. That's right. I want to be the first to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy Christmas season. And you can go to SwitchToAmerica.com right now to see all the alternatives to the everyday items that you use that are made right here in the USA. Again, SwitchToAmerica.com. If you love and support this country and believe that everyone has the right to a Merry Christmas, then please support American companies. <laughs> all right, friends, we've got a special treat for you this week. We're heading halfway around the globe to Egypt, where our friend and international reporter Alex Newman went from Florida to Egypt, and he joins us from the United Nations Climate Change Conference. I just have one question, Alex. How was the camel ride? Yeah, camels. Uh, I, I wish I was riding camels. We have seen a lot of camels, uh, and some of my colleagues got a chance to uh, go on the camels briefly. But uh, no, no time for camels. We're actually staying at a water park. No time for water slides. Haven't even been to the beach yet, even though we're staying at like a world famous beach resort. Because hey, if you're going to save the world from global warming, you might as well do it in style and luxury. But uh, one of the things that really has jumped out to me, uh, being here at this conference, I'm in uh, Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt at the UN uh, Climate Conference. So the COP27, 27th, 27th one of these, and. Uh, it, it, for the first time ever, they actually have a whole pavilion dedicated to what they call uh, children and youth. Uh, so I've spent quite a bit of time talking to these children and youth. Um, very, very interesting. Um, one thing that's immediately apparent is that these poor kids have been brainwashed like you cannot imagine. I mean, they, they are just like rabid repeating the propaganda that they've been taught in their public schools, that the climate crisis, that the CO2 emissions are responsible for it, that we need to shut down uh, energy production, we need to all switch to windmills and solar powers and these kinds of things um that we need climate action that we need climate justice uh, just a little while ago I was, I was speaking with a representative of the youths and uh, he said we need the international court of justice to step in and issue a, an opinion here that governments all over the world can realize that climate change is a violation of human rights um I mean, this is the stuff they're actually saying here and there's a reason why you don't see this stuff in the media in america because if americans saw this stuff they'd pull the plug on the money this whole ridiculous thing would fall apart. But uh, I asked uh, many of these children and, and young people, you know, where'd you learn this? How did you get involved in this climate discussion? And uh, to the extent that they have answered, it, it's always, um, hey, you know, I, I was taught about this in school and, uh, you know, my teacher told me and, uh, you know, the textbook. Uh, so, yeah, they've been taught about this in school. They've been taught that CO2, carbon dioxide, uh, is this terrible demon gas, but that somehow if we pay taxes to the United Nations, if we uh, shut down oil production in America and let the communist Chinese build more coal-fired power plants to spew CO2 in the atmosphere. Somehow that is going to appease the climate gods and uh, and then everything's going to be okay. right? If you just buy more carbon credits from Al Gore, uh, you can pay him to uproot some African villages and plant some trees there and that, that'll get you some carbon credits as they call them, then uh, you'll be totally good. So uh, it, really there's a lot of ignorance among these kids if you ask them you know, where they got these ideas about, if you ask them about the science, they, they really don't know uh, much of anything. If you ask them about the cost of these solutions, they have no idea. Uh, the ones that I've talked to don't even know who paid for them to fly here. I right? well, some coalition of governments or organizations, right? they think they're coming here to speak truth to power. And yet, uh, it, quite ironically, the, the power is the one who paid for their plane tickets, gave them a badge to get in here, set them up with a little pavilion, gave them a script to read when the journalists come around. Um, and, and, you know, some of the stuff that, that you're not supposed to see, right? The, the, I call this the cheerleading section. I'm in the, the section for they prefer to be called journalists, but there's, there really are very few journalists here. And so what you have there is handlers. And uh, we, we actually observed this yesterday. I went and I said, take me to your leader, right? Hey, children, take me to your leader. And like, well, uh, hmm, hmm. so they um, one of the handlers, one of the uh, older gentlemen, uh, he was, I think, Dutch, uh, white European kid. 
uh, he you know rushed around and, and looked for somebody. And then he chased us down later. He brought us this African girl uh, from Sudan. And he's like, here, you can interview her, right? Some diversity, make it look like African girls are demanding these climate justice things. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting that you've got these white European men um, ushering these you know black girls that are kind of confused about what's going on in front of the cameras and, and acting like, you know, this is a legitimate process here. And so the, the real well, the fake media won't show you any of that, but I wanted to share that with you. And we will be posting uh, some of these videos on the New American magazine later. People can check it out. Uh, you can find all that at thenewamerican.com. But um, one of the things that's, in my view, really interesting is that uh, Greta Thunberg, you know, she was the lead child prop for this U.N. climate clown show for several years. Um, she actually has now been thrown overboard because she said this thing is a scam. She said these people are lying. Uh, they're cheating. There's greenwashing, right, the companies that are they're pretending to be green. Uh, so she actually went after uh, people she described as the people in power that are meeting in this tourist paradise in a place where the government violates uh, human rights. So uh, they threw her overboard real quick and they found a new Greta to take her place. It's this girl uh, I think her name is Sophia. Uh, she really likes to show off her skin. You can go to her Instagram page and she's there with bikinis and you know showing her legs and showing her midriff and her stomach and you know low cut shirts. So uh, they found a new Greta, uh, a uh, supposedly more sexy Greta and uh, you know they're doing the photo shoots. She's hanging out with the Secretary General and the, the U.S. government and all this. Um, and, and when you read the media about this you get the sense that like oh these children are rising up to demand a better future. But when you see behind the scenes what's happening, it really is grotesque. So this this children and youth component, uh, which, of course, the U.N. and the government's facilitated, was only made possible by the type of indoctrination we see in public schools that we've been talking about for so long. Uh, frankly, I think it's time that this brainwashing be brought to an end and that children be taught how to think, not what to think. Uh, that's all I got for you guys. Maybe we'll have more next week. Thank you. If you have a smartphone, tablet, Roku, or Apple TV, consider downloading the Freedom Project media app. It's 100% free and includes all of our weekly shows, plus lecture series, archive programs, and award-winning animated videos for families like the Presidential Minute, Battles of America, and Heroes of the West. Don't rely on the social media giants to keep you informed. Simply download the Freedom Project media app from your app store and allow notifications. And we'll let you know when a new video is ready. If rules and doctrines no longer matter, why have them? In another violation of biblical principles, the Progressive United Methodist Church voted to make Reverend Cedric Bridgeforth, an openly gay man, a bishop at their official meeting last week. Well, of course they did. After being elected, Bridgeforth told those gathered at the Western Jurisdiction meeting that he was, quote, grateful to God Almighty and to my husband, Christopher, end quote. But the good news is the United Methodist Church is well, sadly, no longer united around this. I'm David Fiorazzo, and this is Christ and Culture. The United Methodist Church Book of Discipline forbids ordaining practicing homosexuals. It's pretty clear, but rules are meant to be broken, right? The question is, who or what is final authority if you're a Christian? The Book of Jude appeals to Christians to stand up for the truth and fight against attacks on the faith. So see if you notice any similarities to today's church as Jude warned first century Christians saying, quote, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into indecent behavior and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Deception, godlessness, false teachers, nothing new. It's just disappointing. But don't miss the fact that here, major denomination, a man in an open same-sex marriage was still elected to the office of the UMC Bishop. Bridgeforth served as the California Pacific Conference's Director of Innovation and Communication and received, get this, 73 votes out of 93 ballots 
caste. That's a majority, overwhelmingly. But during the last decade, Methodists finally split. Biblical Christians in the denomination are tired of the compromise. LGBTQ policies, women pastors, division over abortion and marriage. So, after years of debate over gay pastors and accommodating sin, conservatives officially parted ways with the UMC and launched its global Methodist church earlier this year. Former UMC General Conference Delegate John Lomperis of the Institute of Religion and Democracy said Bridgeforth's promotion exhibits further direct defiance of the United Methodist Church's official rules, which is increasingly becoming normalized. He adds this, quote, Bishops are entrusted with the sacred responsibility of upholding and enforcing our church's doctrinal and moral standards. When the bishops are so openly breaking these standards, then this is a true inmates running the asylum situation. End quote. According to the Christian Post, Lomperis remarked about a female bishop who also elected by the UMC that she even refused to say if she believes in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Apparently, she doesn't believe in basic biblical doctrine about his incarnation. Now, this is pretty amazing, I guess, but plenty of people mention God or even say they believe in him. But does that faith translate over into your life? That's one question. Where's the fruit? Do you obey the commandments? Anyone can say they're Christian and millions do, but do you really follow Jesus and live out your faith according to the Bible? Are you a man pleaser or a God pleaser? Now, I think we know the answers to these questions, and the truth is sobering because it's reflected in the moral rot and decay of culture and the infestation of social justice and liberal ideologies into not only the culture, but American churches. And, by the way, it's not just one denomination. So it's important to understand this historical decline. Back in 2016, The United Methodist Church appointed the first openly lesbian bishop, and the election was unanimous. Karen Olavito's ordination was later deemed invalid by the church's judicial council a year later, but that didn't matter. She remains in her position to this day. In 2019, the United Methodist Church voted by a slim margin to uphold the church's bans on ordaining LGBTQ clergy and performing same-sex weddings. However, that vote was disregarded, of course, by many progressive leaders within the UMC who rebelled and who continue to commission openly gay clergy as well as officiate same-sex weddings. Now, the Bible warns us to align to, I'm sorry, not to align with those who rebel, and also says God will not be mocked. He never changes, and neither does his word. You will reap what you sow, either sin and corruption or righteousness and everlasting life. Churches have been divided on politics for well over a century, right? But the greater issue here is division over clear biblical doctrines and teachings. By the way, the formerly United Methodist Church is the third largest Protestant denomination in the U.S. The Apostle Paul said, Because the Holy Spirit lives in believers, we are temples of the living God. And it also says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Therefore, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So, how about you? How about your church? Do you have a decision to make about your leadership and about whether to stay there? Remember, Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than man. So if people in our own churches no longer adhere to or believe what the Bible teaches, it doesn't matter what they say, they are conforming to the world rather than to Christ. Don't fall away, friends, from the one true faith. Let's run the race and stay the course. 
God bless you and keep speaking the truth about things that matter. Do you love America? Are you a patriot who desires to preserve the freedoms we enjoy for generations to come? Then let's take action. Every few days we give our money to the big box stores. How we spend our dollars could be the most important vote. Do these stores promote freedom and American values? Is that where we should be buying our everyday household products for the rest of our lives? What if we just stop? What if we shop with a family-owned manufacturer who believes in preserving our freedoms? That's why SwitchToAmerica.com was created. SwitchToAmerica.com gives patriots the ability to walk away from the big box stores forever. This is a movement that pledges allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. SwitchToAmerica.com Take action if you love this country. Here is a great way to show it. SwitchToAmerica.com The formidable Greek philosopher, scientist, intellectual, and scholar Aristotle has contributed as much to the development of Western culture as any person in history over the last 3,000 years. The poet Dante referred to him as the master of those who know, while to many others he is simply known as the philosopher. Born in 384 BC in Stagira in northern Greece, Aristotle descended from a medical family. His father, Nicomachus, served as court physician to King Amentus III of Macedon. Both of his parents died young, and at age 17, Aristotle was sent to Athens to enroll in Plato's academy. For the next 20 years, Aristotle both studied and taught in the academy, becoming the most gifted of Plato's mentees, even convincing the master to soften some of his deeply held philosophical positions. With Plato's death in 347 BC, Aristotle left the academy to live in Assos, where he married his wife Pythias, who would give birth to his only daughter, also named Pythias. In 342 BC, King Philip II of Macedon summoned Aristotle to his capital, Pella, to serve as tutor to his young son, Alexander. Destined to become Alexander the Great, one of the most accomplished military geniuses of history, Aristotle's tutelage would refine Alexander's character and add wisdom and discretion to his other natural intellectual and martial talents. Under the influence of Aristotle, Alexander studied literature and moral philosophy, which provided him with a broader understanding of human nature. His desire to cultivate virtue was so intense that he even slept with a copy of the Iliad under his pillow. So important was Aristotle's teaching that Alexander brought the philosopher with him on his military campaigns. But a single student, even one as impressive as Alexander, was not enough to exhaust the knowledge contained within Aristotle. At the age of 50, he opened his own school, known as the Lyceum. Complete with a library, this philosophical school brought together research students, like himself, called peripatetics, which means those given to walking about. The name was derived from Aristotle's habit of pacing during his lectures. Aristotle and the Peripatetics conducted scientific and philosophical research, attempting to answer questions about human existence, like what is happiness, what is the good, and what is the nature of the soul. In the Nicomachean Ethics, named after his son Nicomachus, Aristotle lists 12 primary virtues that must be practiced actively in order to be fully realized in human behavior. For Aristotle, the highest virtues are moral and intellectual, and those who lack virtue are unfortunate. His endless search for knowledge and scientific truth led Aristotle to develop or considerably expand numerous intellectual and scientific disciplines. There is almost no category of knowledge or learning that Aristotle did not enhance in some way. Some of his most important and consistent work was formulating knowledge and arguments about the soul, which he argued separated living things from non-living things, and which dictated the higher capacities that distinguished human beings from other animals. After the death of his former student, Alexander the Great, in 323 BC, Aristotle was forced to flee Athens amid rising anti-Macedonian sentiment. 
Within a year, Aristotle would fall ill and die of an unexplained digestive complaint. Aristotle's soul may have left his earthly body 2,400 years ago, but his teachings, experiments, and intellectual achievements have endured to this day and helped set the foundations of Western thought and science. In his own words, he understood that the greatest virtues are those which are most useful to other persons. We want to hear from you. If you have a question or comment for Katie, David, or any of our other show hosts, simply visit stayeducated.org. That's stayeducated.org and submit your question or comment. Our team loves to hear from you and might just give you a shout out on air. Again, visit stayeducated.org and connect with us. <sighs> I'm tired. Are you tired? We're going to wrap this week up with one story out of Florida where Alex is not anymore, where a teacher <laughs> is calling for her school to take action against a very offensive parking spot. Sounds a, a little odd, right? Well, Marina Gentilesco is an instructional assistant at Wiregrass Ranch High School, and she claims a Bible verse painted on a school parking lot is so offensive that it brings flashbacks from the Holocaust. Okay, I'm a little confused about this because you've got a Bible verse, and I, I'm actually I'm not confused that the word Christ is offensive because that does offend a lot of people, but I'm confused at the verbiage and the rhetoric of I'm not sure if she's a Democrat of those on the left who would be intolerant of the Christian faith because they just want to keep our faith behind closed doors, keep keep that behind the church, don't bring it out in public, and this is a very familiar verse. You see this in end zones at football games. If you put it on a state-funded property, I'm not okay with it. Marina Gentilesco is an instructional assistant at Wiregrass Ranch High School. She walks by this parking spot every day. It doesn't belong there. Anywhere else, not a problem. At school, it doesn't belong there. It says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Gentilesco expressed her frustrations to her principal, who checked in with the district. Pasco County Schools will not be removing the Bible verse. It is not a, a violation. Um, this is personal expression. There is no proselytizing going on. It's not compelling students to do anything one way or the other. Wow, she has to walk by that every day. <laughs> but I'm sorry, the district school resource officer went on to say it has nothing to do with instruction. It's just a teacher expressing themselves just like they might wear a crucifix on their shirt. Teachers and students are free to express themselves. Uh, she says, uh, Marina says, Every time she walks by it, I feel like it's attacking me as a Jew and brings me to the verge of tears when she walks by a parking space because it brings me back to the six million, it was more like seven million that perished uh, of because we're Jews because of our faith. Katie, now this is where it gets a little wacky here because the Christians had nothing to do with the Holocaust. Well, it, you know, and I'm, I'm going, wow, this is just a Bible verse. Yeah, it's it's a Bible verse on a parking stall, which is probably covered maybe by the time she gets there. With the so car? She, but she knows the it's truck. under there. She saw the, it's a black truck. Maybe <laughs> that's it. But but she, I mean, she's, they're even talking about like, it's n like if you wear a crucifix around your neck, like it's just a symbol of it. Wouldn't that be it. offensive Yeah, to her? well, considering she's wearing the Star of David, if you go back and look, what if the rest of us are all offended by Wait her wearing minute. that for yeah. some, you know, like that again, as he said in the video, it's not like they're pushing anything. They're not trying to, all right, students, class is outside today in the parking stall and we're going to read the Bible verse and then discuss it and you're going to memorize it and you're going to live by it. Like none of that is happening. None of that. But in her mind, she, uh, she clearly has something going on where if we want to use the term triggered, like, she's triggered by that. Like, she must be triggered at other things. Well, it's interesting that we don't do a lot of these things that, that the people on the left do. They get so um, upset with our expressions of faith. And I, I've heard the stories. I've read. I mean, there's lawsuits, Liberty Council, and, and they come up constantly because of this. But um, I feel bad for her. But come on. I mean, this is America. Don't be so intolerant of other people's speech. All right. Well... That's where we're going to end yeah. the speech for today. <laughs> we're going to wrap up this entire week we're on preaching Educated. Tolerance here. We are preaching tolerance, but getting out of here. Uh, David and I will be taking a break next week. Happy Thanksgiving. 
happy Thanksgiving to uh, give thanks for many things, including all of you. In yes. You're the ones. You make this show possible because otherwise we'd just be talking to absolutely no one. And I, I don't need to talk to David any more than I already do, right? Yeah, but we do get along, though. That I is true. And uh, happy Thanksgiving and happy upcoming Christmas season. And don't say, don't cave and say holidays. Happy holidays. But not to worry. That's for another show. We'll be back uh, right after Thanksgiving with full bellies of good turkey and all kinds of stuff, all of our favorites, and a lot of stories to share. So for Katie and myself, may you and your loved ones have a very blessed and happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the pumpkin pie and all things pumpkin spice. And as always, stay educated. <laughs>